the message of salvation comes with a cost. Not that there is something that we have to pay in order to buy ourselves salvation, uh, but there is a cost in following the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no ladder up to heaven, do this, do that, and you'll be saved at the end. But there is a pathway to glory. And that pathway is peppered with suffering. And it is a pathway that we all must walk who name the name of the Lord. Jesus said this in John chapter 16, verse 33. In the world you will have tribulation. Fear not, I have overcome the world. But in the world you will have tribulation. And Paul said in Acts 14, 22, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. And the word that the Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul use, this word tribulations, is the same word that we find Paul using here in Romans 5 and verse 3. So can I encourage you to turn again to uh, the book of Romans, chapter 5, and, and have a look at verse 3. Tribulations. The New King James Version, is, that's the way that it is translated. But literally, this word in, in the Scriptures means pressures. Those things that make us feel hemmed in and confined and constricted with no way of escape. And I expect that language, even though that's exactly what this word means, is very familiar to us at the moment. Have you felt hemmed in lately? With nowhere to go lately? Confined? Constricted? Restricted? Well, the pressures that are being spoken about here are those pressures that are specific to Christians. As believers, as those who've been called out from the world to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to face the fact that in this life we will face suffering for the very fact that we are believers. We can't escape that reality. So what I want to do tonight is not to try and hide from this, uh, but address it because because we will face these sufferings. And so I want us to think about what our attitude should be to the sufferings of the Christian life, and then what God's plan and purpose is in bringing suffering along our path. Because we believe in a God who is all sovereign, in control of, of all things, and especially the lives of believers. And so when suffering comes in, how do we respond to it? And what is God doing in it? But whilst the tribulations that Paul is talking about here specifically refer to the opposition and persecution of a hostile world, I think it is legitimate for us to take what is being taught here and apply it to all of the things that we suffer. Because whatever our pressures are, if we're believers, we need to know how to face them as believers. We still need to know how to act and react and respond in faith and learn what it is in the middle of our own weakness to prove the Lord amongst the pressures that come our way. So just two points tonight, and uh, here's the first. The believer's attitude to suffering. The believer's attitude to suffering. Romans 5 verse 3 makes it very plain what our attitude should be if we are believers. It tells us that we should glory in our suffering. Uh, and on first hearing, that, that may seem, sound a little bit strange to us. But it only becomes stranger when we understand what this word glory means. Glory in suffering, what does it mean? Well, the word translated glory in verse 3 
is the same word, and you see it with me, translated in verse 2 as rejoice. In other words, rejoice in suffering. Verse 2, Paul is saying that the justified sinner rejoices in the hope of the glory of God. They rejoice in the fact that one day Jesus is going to come back, not this time in humility, but in power and glory. And God will be glorified. And that makes sense to us. We were looking at this a couple of weeks ago, what it is to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, that Jesus will return in great splendor and glory. This is something to rejoice in, that every eye will see him, and every knee will bow before him, and our, self, our salvation will be complete. God will be glorified in our rescue, not just from this present evil world, but from our own sin and failure and death and hell itself. This is something to rejoice in, to, to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But we may be forgiven for being a little bit stumped by verse 3. Have a look at it with me. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, pressures, hardships, sufferings. What does that mean? Well, first of all, I want to consider what glorying in suffering does not mean. Uh, glorying or rejoicing in suffering does not mean that we are stoic about suffering. To be stoic about something is to endure pain or hardship without showing any feeling or complaining at all. Uh, and that's not Christian. The Psalms are full of the writings of people showing their feelings, uh, putting them on display, writing them down, and, and even making their complaints known. Not that they're complaining about God or their situation to others, but they're bringing their complaints to God, laying them before him, their hurts and their sorrows and their cares and their pressures, telling the Lord all about them, complaining to the Lord God. The title of Psalm 102 is a prime example. A prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. There's something very right about bringing our cares and yes, even our complaints to the Lord and laying them before him not complaining about him, not complaining to others about our situation, but bringing our complaint to the Lord. That is the complete opposite of stoically resigning ourselves to a fate because we can't do anything about it. And so we might as well just grin and bear it. That is not what rejoicing in suffering is all about. Neither is rejoicing in suffering, finding pleasure in the pain itself. In our fallen and broken world, there are some who inflict pain on themselves in order to find pleasure. And this is a sad and unhealthy way to pursue happiness or relief. It is completely contrary to what God has designed for human flourishing and happiness. We can seek joy in the pain, but we sh shouldn't be seeking pain for joy. The pleasure is not in the pain itself, and it shouldn't be sought there. We need to be clear on this point. There is nothing inherently good about suffering and pain. And nor is God the author of evil. Jesus did not submit himself to his Father's will and go to the cross because of the joy of the scourging or the enjoyment of mockery or because he appreciated the shame or the humiliation or because he enjoyed the pain and the anguish of being nailed on public view on a cross. No, he went to the cross 
for the joy that was set before him. That's what meant that he went through with it. Because of what awaited him on the other side of it. To glory in tribulations is not to glory in suffering for the for suffering's sake. But nor is it to rejoice in the fact that we are better off than the next person. And I think as believers we can be guilty of this perhaps uh, more than some of these other um, uh, things that I've mentioned. We can be guilty of weighing up our current situation and seeking solace merely in the fact that others have got it worse than we have. Not that we put others down or that we are uh, gossips or slanderous towards them, but, but that somehow the, our final comfort or our final word on a thing lies in the fact that we can't complain because there's always someone worse off. Now let's take that to the worst case scenario. What if we were the worst off? Who would we compare ourselves to then? Where would we find our joy then if we couldn't say, oh, well, there's, there's always somebody worse off than me? Counting our blessings and being grateful is not a bad thing at all. In fact, it is a very good thing. And we must always count our blessings and give thanks to God for them. Even write down the things that God has done in answer to our prayers. Thanking him often for what he has done for us. However, merely recognising that our situation could be worse is not what it means to rejoice in suffering. No, glorying and rejoicing amid suffering means rejoicing in this fact that God has a plan and a purpose in it. We do not suffer without hope. We do not suffer in a situation that is out of control. We suffer knowing that God has a design even in this. So the second thing, and final thing, that I want us to see is the plan and purpose of God in the believer's suffering. God's plan and purpose in the believer's suffering is two-pronged. He, he's got both the end and the here and now in view. He, he's got the end in view. His plan in the long term is to bring his children to glory. As we've already said, the pathway to glory is marked out by suffering. Or as John Stott uh, more poignantly said, suffering is the one and only path to glory. There's no other path. There's no other way. Just as the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So too is suffering the way that the believer comes to glory. Why is that? Because as Christ's road was marked out with suffering, so too is the Christian's. Not only do we see that right throughout the Scriptures, but we see it right throughout church history. It's a principle laid down Suffering now, glory then. But you know, even in that suffering, there can be great joy. Have a look at verse 5. This is not what we're concentrating on today, uh, but we have it there. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Christian faces suffering, but they do not face that suffering alone. The Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God is with them. And it's in the moment of great suffering that the Lord can come upon a person. The Spirit of grace and of glory can rest upon them. And they can know the love of God filling them. God with them, the assurance that though the storm may rage without me, it is well with my soul. This is the reality and the possibility of the Christian. But there's more to be known of the experience 
of God's Holy Spirit with us in the midst of suffering. Suffering is the path that the Christian must walk. It is the way the Master went. Should not the servant tread it still? And Paul makes this absolutely plain in chapter 8 and verse 17 when he says that we are co-heirs with Christ. To be a co-heir is to, is to um, have the same privilege as the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But it goes on. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Not that we share in his sufferings on the cross when he paid the price for our sins, but that we walk the road that he is leading us to walk as believers in Christ Jesus, and he walks it with us. If we are believers, then we rejoice in our sufferings in this life because we know where they are taking us. They're not leading us into the ditch. They're not leading us into the dirt. They're not leading us downwards. They are taking us upwards. They're taking us to glory. And this reality was poignant for Paul. In fact, it was so poignant that he was able to say amidst perhaps the worst sufferings, for I consider, Romans 8, verse 18, that the sufferings of this present time, and we remember that Paul was stoned and uh, almost to death, and he was whipped, and, uh, and he was hated, and he was chased after, and, and there's a whole list of things that happened to the Apostle Paul. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Little sufferings in comparison to the glory that we're headed to. God's plan and purpose in suffering is to bring us to glory. And so when we suffer, however little we feel that suffering is, the sort that we're tempted to just, let's just wipe out the way as if it's not significant, or huge sufferings that we may be facing in the long term, the Lord is preparing us for glory. And in that, we can rejoice. But secondly, in our second point, the Lord has got the here and now in view. He's not just got the long road ahead in view in taking us to glory. He's also concerned in the here and now. His work in us in the here and now. And like a master weaver, he weaves the suffering into the fabric of our lives in order to make us into the people that he's calling us to be. Mature believers in Christ. This is something that we can rejoice in. Even under the harshest pressures that weigh down on us, that in the midst of these pressures, the Lord is working his plans and purposes in us, that we might be mature believers ready to stand before him. But we will only become the people that he is calling us to be if we respond to the suffering that he sent our way in the right way. If we receive suffering with anger, uh, shaking our fists in God's face, because uh, why would he bring this in my way? Uh, uh, how can he do this? Uh, this is just too much. What is he thinking? If we're shaking our fists in his face, or, or if we receive suffering with bitterness, resenting the path that we've been called to walk along, or if we receive suffering with faithlessness, refusing to see or even look for God in it, then the fruits that God lovingly wants to produce in us won't be brought forth. We've got to respond rightly to the suffering that is brought into our lives, even the suffering that we're facing right now. And I remind us, as verse 5 tells us, that we have been given the Holy Spirit. We're not alone as we face the suffering that is brought along our path in this sinful and fallen world. But 
But how we respond to this suffering is all important. The same suffering that caused Job to worship caused his wife to want Job to curse God and die. You remember it was her children that died and, uh, and her property that was taken as well as Job's. It was Job's wife. But she responded in faithlessness and Job in faith. To grow in maturity through our suffering, we need to respond positively to it. And Paul gives us three steps to this. Look at verse 3. We glory in tribulations, knowing that one, tribulation produces perseverance, and two, perseverance character, and three, character hope. There are steps. And the first step to maturity and rejoicing in the midst of our suffering is that suffering produces perseverance. In the same way that we can't learn patience without having to wait, we can't learn perseverance without having to suffer. Perseverance is that ability to patiently endure and remain steadfast under trial or amidst difficulty, to keep on trusting the Lord, to keep our heads. And we will never know how to patiently endure or to remain steadfast, how to keep our heads, if we never come into contact with difficulty, if we're never brought to have to suffer. This has got to change the way that we view the difficulties that we are facing right now. I could say whatever those difficulties are, and no doubt we're all facing uh, dif different difficulties, but even in the shared difficulty of the coronavirus, we've got to see that the Lord has graciously brought these difficulties along our path in order to teach us to persevere. There is a plan in this. There is a purpose in this. We can rejoice in this. But why do we need to learn perseverance? Why is that essential for us? Because of what perseverance leads to. Perseverance, secondly, produces character. Verse 4. What's character? It's that quality that is only produced in us having passed through deep waters of testing. The word in the Greek carries the meaning of being tried and tested uh, and then approved as a result. Uh, almost like the, the um, wannabe army officer who's gone through his training and got to the end of it and he's been given the, mark, the stamp of approval because he's been tested and tried and he's passed, he's, he, he's, he's got the mark. We can think of Jacob, who persevered in wrestling with God all night. And though he came away from the encounter limping, he came away blessed as an overcomer. Character is what is produced in us when we prove the, the Lord in the midst of our suffering. While Satan brings temptations in order to destroy our faith, in order to break us up, in order to dampen down our love, in order to destroy our hope, in order to take away our faith, the Lord graciously and in mercy brings tests into our lives which in themselves can be difficult. Peter says, fiery trials, and yet he does it in order to test and to prove our character. Character is what is produced in us when we prove the Lord in the midst of our sufferings. So let's make this personal. I wonder what way we will come out of this pandemic. I wonder how we'll remember it and look back on it. We may have struggled. There's no shame in that. It's been a hard time. But will we come out of it, God willing, with a more fully formed character, having persevered under the trial of it and 
having proved the Lord in it. I don't say this so that we have a guilt trip about the past. I say it so that we trust the Lord in the present, believing that he has a plan and a purpose even in this. And in that we can rejoice because it is this path that he has brought into our lives, that he has set out before us to walk on in order to take us to glory, that we might persevere, that he might prove us and lead us, thirdly, to hope. Why hope? We've already seen it in the message that I preached previously. Hope is essential. Uh, it was in the concentration camps uh, that uh, those who had hope continued to the end, it was said. Perhaps because God gives hope to his people, they're enabled to continue. But why hope? Why does um, perseverance produce character and character produce hope? Because as the Lord has developed our character in the past, uh, and as he is developing it in the present, so too can he be relied on in the future top lady displays it for us in one of his hymns. Kind author and ground of my hope, be thee for my God I avow, my glad Ebenezer set up, and own thou hast helped me till now. I muse on the years that are past, wherein my defence thou hast proved, nor wilt thou relinquish at last a sinner so singularly loved. He's known the Lord's help in the past. He's proved the Lord in the past. The Lord has come through for him in the past. And so he's able to set up his Ebenezer. He's able to say, hitherto, up until now, the Lord has helped me. And therefore I have hope for the future. Because I know the Lord is with me. The Christian whose character has been produced in the furnace of suffering can say, I have been helped, and I am being helped, and this gives me hope. I wonder, can you say the same? Do you know the God of the Word at work in your own experience? John Newton knew it. He was uh, a wretched man before coming to Christ. But he said these words, when he come to Christ. Yet though I am not what I ought to be, nor what I wish to be, nor what I hope to be, I can truly say I am not what I once was, a slave to sin and Satan. We glory and rejoice in suffering because suffering is both the past pathway to glory as well as the gateway to maturity. And it's in that that we know the joy of God. Perhaps you're a believer and you're struggling. Perhaps it is because you are being a Christian at work, at school, in your family, and it is difficult. Take heart. The Lord has brought us along your path for a reason. He is taking you on the path to glory. And he is proving your character. He is strengthening your hope as you persevere in faith. And hope, verse 5 tells us, will never be disappointed. Perhaps you're suffering and it's just the sufferings of life. It's difficult in this pandemic. Perhaps your health condition is not a good one. Perhaps you've lost loved ones recently. You're walking the path of suffering. The message comes to you too. The Lord has a plan and a purpose. If you're in Christ, if you're trusting in him by faith, if he is your all, if he is your saviour, if you can say, the Lord is my rock and my redeemer, you too can be sure, in the midst of this, 
The Lord has a plan as he's leading you to glory. And in the midst of it, as you persevere, as you're strengthened in character, as your hope builds, that hope will never be disappointed. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let's pray together. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we confess that we often don't understand what it is that you're doing in our lives. Oftentimes our faith is knocked by the situations. Lord, instead of being led to believe that you're at work in us, Lord, we can be tempted to believe that you've forgotten us or that you've left us. Lord, please help us to battle those lies that come from the evil one and help us to trust you more and more as we see the coming day your return. Thank you, Lord Jesus, uh, for saving us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, even for sending sufferings into our lives to test us and to try us, to bring us forth as gold, to strengthen hope in us that will never be disappointed. Lord, please strengthen us to walk by faith and not by sight, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name.